that, uh, as you all know, she's Professor Emerita at the Nair University at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning, and has uh, done a vast amount of work on agrarian conditions, both uh, through history and in the current situation. Among her recent books is The Long Transition, which includes a wealth of economic history material as well as uh, more recent discussions. Um, good morning, everyone. It's obvious that uh, the organizers did not expect uh, such an enormous turnout. Otherwise, we would have gone for a larger hall. And we know very well why so many of you are here. You're here to listen to Professor Irfan Habib, ultimately. Okay. Uh, not to not to tyros like us. Uh, despite all that uh, Jayati has tried to say, I feel myself to be an absolute interloper, an economist daring to talk uh, on uh, on history, admittedly economic history. My only excuse would be that uh, every Marxist, whatever his or her discipline, uh, has to be deeply interested in. Uh, in history. Um, and I consider myself to be extremely fortunate that I started my doctoral research uh, in 1967 after obtaining my uh, MA at a time when uh, these giants of uh, Marxist theorizing in the field of history were producing their works. So Sometime around 1968, well, my thesis actually was on contemporary, at that time, contemporary capitalist development in Indian agriculture. But uh, of course, we were all deeply interested in history. And sometime around 1968, I read uh, both uh, D.D. Kosambi's works as well as Professor Habib's uh, correctly described magisterial agrarian system of Mughal India, followed up with all the numerous and extremely insightful and stimulating papers that he wrote, which were mainly published at that time, if I remember, in a journal called Inquiry, which later became defunct, but which have subsequently been collected together in the Tulika volume. And so we don't have to go through, as I did for decades and decades, one had to get together these tattered uh, you know, issues of inquiry in order to access Professor Habib's work. Now it's all uh, together, fortunately. Now, um, since you're all here to hear Professor Habib, essentially, I will try to be brief, though I cannot claim to the extreme brevity that uh, Professor Sadish Chandra has displayed. I don't have very much to say, except to say that there are only about three points I want to make. The first is that what I personally, and this is a very personal kind of take on Professor Habib's work, what I personally found extremely fascinating about his agrarian system of Mughal India was the uh, way in which he discussed and documented the hierarchy of rights to land in this period. Now, every pre-capitalist system is characterized by a hierarchy of rights to land. The land, as we know, is the main arena of economic activity, though of course there is also manufacturing production at an artisanal level. And the land, the produce of the land is the source, main source of economic surplus. So to be able to trace clearly what exactly the rights were to the produce of the land of the different classes within the rural population, who were the zamindars? In what way did their right differ from that of the talukdas? In what way was the zamindar's right in turn subordinate, subordinate to the right of the state, the centralized Mughal state? What were the kind of rights that the peasantry had? Did they have a customary right of occupation? Could they be evicted or not evicted? Were the peasantry subject to any form of extra economic coercion? We know that there existed a class of laborers who did not possess any property at all. And this was very closely related to the caste system. And Professor Habib was one of the first to point out that the class of agricultural laborers, even though it expanded enormously in the colonial period, actually 
started from a pre-existing class of propertyless persons. But if you leave aside these propertyless persons, if you look at the peasantry proper, who had their own uh, tangible means of production, uh, non-land means of production, like plows and cattle and so on, they had operated with their own family labor. Were they subject to any kind of extra economic coercion, to uh, lack of mobility? Could we find any parallels between their situation and the situation of serfs in medieval Europe? These were the kinds of questions with which a Marxist would naturally be concerned. And even though Professor Habib in his book did not mention European feudalism even once, I do not think he uses the term feudalism at all when he's talking about Mughal India. But nevertheless, implicit in his detailed description, there was a very clear idea which was put forward of this hierarchy of rights to the produce of the land. And a very clear idea emerged of the enormously high level of concentration of the economic surplus in very few hands in Mughal India. At the time that I was reading the agrarian system, I recollect thinking that somehow it was not connected to the systems which came earlier. Because in our society, you know, every new class of surplus appropriators uh, has superimposed itself on a pre-existing system. I think it was uh, EMS Nambudripad who in his usual insightful manner had talked about the history of Indian society and economy being a series of superimpositions, of there not being a revolutionary breakdown of, a, of the old order, but of simply a kind of superimposition of a new system on the old one. Of course, modifying the old system in the process. But even though the pre-existing system of the Sultanate period was not discussed in the agrarian system of Mughal India, uh, when we do look at Professor Habib's other writings, particularly his long paper on uh, property rights, I forget the exact title uh, right now, uh, which really goes from ancient India to relatively modern times, then that particular question gets answered uh, in that paper. So this is what I found extremely uh, fascinating. The second point is, relates to the whole question of the purchase and sale of zamindaris. Now there's an economic element here, which is why I feel confident talking about it. And I'll just take a few minutes talking about that. page 187 of the new edition of the agrarian system of Mughal India, Professor Habib gives some, uh, well, page 188, table 5.1, he gives some very interesting data on the sale price of zamindaris and the land revenue assessed on the same zamindaris. He's taken the data from uh, a locality, Shamsabad in the Doab, bordering about uh, upon Avad, though in the text he mentions other examples as well. And he says that uh, this is where the connect to more modern times uh, emerges. Um, anyone familiar with transactions in modern real estate would be surprised to find that the price of a zamindari in Mughal times was seldom more than double, and in a few cases only barely in excess of the land revenue demand for one year. Although the price should have been the capitalized value of the annual income expected from possession of that right. Quite right, the price has to be the capitalism, capitalized value of the annual income expected from the possession of the right. But then what is the annual income which a person purchasing a zamindari might expect? From Professor Habib's own documentation, uh, it is clear he divides the annual income into two parts. One is the uh, Malikana, uh, which the Mughal authorities recognized by allowing 10% of the revenue uh, to the Zamindar, of the total revenue collections to the Zamindar. And the other is, uh, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it correctly, Nankar, uh, which was 5 to 10% uh, in addition. So he says that. Uh, <clears throat> Except in Gujarat, 
where the proportion was higher, 15 to 20 percent of the total revenue is what the Samindar got to keep, right? Now, if that is the case, and we take the uh, figures that he gives for the uh, total sale price of the villages, Zamindari villages, which was rupees 1201, let us say rupees 1200, and the total of the averages of land revenue, which was rupees 526, uh, he says that, look, the sale price of the villages was not even two and a half times. The, uh, uh, the land revenue and uh, annual, uh, yes, the price of the Zamindari was thus less than two and a half times the annual land revenue. So this is supposed to be low and not only here but even when we come to the discussion of historians for later times when they're looking at the sale of Zamindaris in the colonial period, in the early colonial period in Bengal you know that under the permanent settlement, uh, the British exacted um, more than nine-tenths of the total assessed rental, what they call the rental of an estate by way of uh, revenue, and they left less than one-tenth, in fact around nine percent, in the hand of the zamindar as his income. And many zamindars in the early years could not afford to uh, default it on this. And if they defaulted for two years or three years, their Zamindari estates were put up for auction to the highest bidder. And the British administrators continuously bemoaned the fact that the price realized in the auction was only 60% or 80% of one year's revenue arrears. Again, when we come to Professor Binay Bhushan Chaudhary's work, uh, he did a detailed study of auction prices of Zamindaris, which interested not only me but also Professor Amit Bharuri. Uh, in our center, I remember having a discussion with Professor Bhadavi on this. And again, Professor Chaudhary said that, uh, echoing the British administrators, that the prices were too low. They did not even cover one year's arrears. Now, I remember discussing with Professor Bhadavi that the prices are not too low. They're too high, as a matter of fact. I'll come to the substantive point in a moment, after I've gone through the arithmetic. The prices are too high because, after all, when a person was buying a Zamindari, what he was buying is not the total revenue. What he was buying is the right to only one-fifth of the total revenue. So if the total, uh, uh, the average of land revenue was 526 rupees, one-fifth of that would be only 105 rupees. All right? And if, as Professor Habib says, in 10 years you want to recoup your purchase price, that means a rate of interest of 10%. All right. So 105 capitalized at a rate of interest of 10% is simply 105 divided by 0 0.1, that is 10 times 105, or 1,050 rupees. But they were actually paying 1,200. They were paying much more than would be justified if, in fact, the market rate of interest was 10%. Now, actually, the market rate of interest could not have been as low as 10%. I don't know, I mean, there's no mention in the sources I've seen of what the market rate of interest was. But, um, you know, the rate of interest on fixed deposits now you get is almost 10% in the modern economy. And in an economy like Mughal India, where you had much greater monopolization of money capital, I imagine the rate of interest would have been more than 10%. And the higher the rate of interest, the lower the multiplier by which you multiply the income to get the capitalized value. For example, if the rate of interest was 12.5%, quite reasonable, then the income that the Zamindar was expecting, 105 rupees per annum, would be multiplied by 8. And he would be rational in paying 800 rupees, not 1200 rupees. Okay? I, I suppose the arithmetic is very simple, not difficult to understand at all. So, the question arises, First of all, why was everyone saying it's too low? Professor Habib does not say it's too low. He, in fact, infers from the sale price that the zamindar could have got at most a quarter because he takes 10% as the rate of interest implicitly by saying the recoupment has to be within 10 years. But in Professor Chaudhary's work, in, in the works of the utterances of the British administrators, Invariably, they're always saying zamindari prices were too low. 
And I would not be surprised if today teachers of economic history, when they are discussing the colonial period or the Mughal period, tell their students the prices were very low because they did not cover even one year's arrears. In fact, the converse is the case. The prices were too high if we take reasonable rates of interest. I remember after this discussion, Professor Bhaduri, uh, who had a great facility for uh, constructing models, dashed off a paper on, uh, in which he dis made precisely this point. But of course, he filled it with uh, formulae, with integrals, and so on. So the historians paid no attention to it. And maybe I'm being uh, indiscreet, but I remember <laughs> Professor Bhakti. In fact, uh, when, uh, when he met me immediately after the publication of Professor Bhaduri's paper, laughing and saying, so your colleague Amit thinks that he can discuss land prices by giving us integrals and formulae. And he was laughing away. But uh, I, my take on this is a little different. Uh, we are not concerned with formulae and integrals and all that. The basic point is very commonsensical, very simple. I think this has very important uh, implications. Uh, and that is that if people purchasing zamindaris were paying prices which appear to be rather on the high side, far from being on the low side, to me this suggests, and this is just common sense, I mean I have absolutely no knowledge of the conditions of that period, to me it suggests that probably the zamindars made illegal exactions. That is they expected to get more than 20% of the revenue as annual income. And uh, in fact, we find this is the case in all other societies which have been called feudal. I'm not calling Mughal India feudal. I'm too scared to do that in <laughs> Professor Habib's presence. But in Japan, for example, the daimyo used to impose taxes on the number of doors the peasant houses had. There are all kinds of debt duties. So to me, it suggests that probably the legally recognized ex uh, exactions of the zamindars which was the Malikana and the Lanka, probably did not make up the whole of their income. They might well have oppressed the peasantry by putting additional assessors, taxes of various kinds, which are not recognized in the literature. If that is the case, if their income was actually higher than the figures given, then that would explain why they were uh, prepared to pay 1,200 rupees for a zamindari when they should not have paid more than 1,000 rupees, 800 to 1,000 uh, rupees, such high prices. So this is, a, this is a thought I would like to leave with the historians who are working with data. Uh, because once you have this idea in your head, you, you may actually go around looking for evidence that illegal exactions of various kinds did indeed uh, take place. And I would like to wind up, sorry, I've taken uh, too long. Uh, I would like to wind up by saying that the most exciting part of Professor Habib's uh, work in the agrarian system of Mughal India, for me was precisely his discussion of present revolts and his thesis of over-exploitation of the peasantry. He linked peasant revolts in India, the Satnamis, the Jats and the Sikhs. I don't think anybody had looked at the peasant uprisings in quite that light before. And he linked this to the very uh, method of administration of the Mughal system in which the Jagiddars <coughs> were not in hereditary occupation of their Jagis. They could be moved around at will, at the will of the emperor. They were there on, in a particular territorial unit for a short period of time. And he points out, of course he doesn't give it as his opinion, he buttresses this with detailed evidence from the sources that this tended to a mentality in which uh, they said that let us grab as much as we can get because we are only going to be here a few years before we are transferred. And this very system of imperial control over the Jagidvas, which made it a centralized system and a very efficiently administered system, also meant that it promoted over-exploitation of the Jagidvas taking much more from the peasantry than they were legally supposed to. Pushing the peasantry down to an unbearably low level, lower even than the customary level of subsistence. I can see the echoes of the European transition debate in this. That is the Dobb thesis, uh, which I found quite convincing, of over-exploitation of the peasantry leading to an eventual breakdown of the feudal system in, 
in, in Europe. Now, um, Professor Habib, of course, does not refer to the European transition debate at all. But what he is saying is essentially very similar, that it was the over-exploitation of the peasantry which eventually led to the breakdown of this system which was instituted uh, under the Mughals. And he also toys a little bit, does not go very much into the question of why when peasant revolts were so important in China, they never cohered together and led to uh, overthrow of the system, uh, of the entire system in India. Uh, he, he, he gives various reasons which I need not go into here. But this really was the, uh, was the, was the most interesting and exciting part uh, of his, uh, of his uh, thesis, which of course arose directly from his uh, Marxist, as he calls it himself, his Marxist, uh, perception. And finally, you know, the, uh, a lot of people have talked about the meticulous scholarship which has gone into the making of this work, as indeed into the making of all of <laughs> Professor Habib's writings. Now, when you are dealing at such a le level of detail and such a level of uh, referencing as Professor Habib does, it is easy to lose sight of the wood for the trees. You tend to get, I mean, many academics uh, tend to get, you know, absorbed in uh, the minutiae because they're looking at matters in such detail. But with Professor Habib, we have this rare combination, and that is what, of course, made, made him also a legend and made this work such a classic of meticulous scholarship. Every statement is has some backup, you know, there is a reference to back it up. There is nothing which is said in an... Uh, in a careless or irresponsible manner, but at the same time, there is an underlying unity to the entire analysis, which is basically provided by his uh, the framework of Marxist class analysis. That is what underlies the entire discussion. That is what gives it an overarching unity, and which makes it's certain that the reader does not get lost in the welter of details, does not lose the bigger picture. Let me stop there. I think I've already taken about half an hour. And thank you again for this meeting. Thank you, Vinay. Uh, thank you, Vinay. Thank you very much Utsa, for that economic angle to the book. And it's very good that this is going to be followed up uh, with Professor Shirin Muswi. Uh, again, I think many of you here are already familiar with her work. Professor Musfi is, of course, a professor at Arika and has a very long uh, history of intellectual collaboration with Professor Habib. There are many, but when I think of Shirin's work, I think of uh, the, uh, the economy of the Mughal Empire, but she was telling me that currently more people know her uh, small book on the episodes of the life of Akbar because it's uh, one of those storytelling books that is very approachable to me. of the Center for Economic Studies and Planning at JNU, we have an opportunity of discussing a book which first published 50 years, 50 years ago. And, that, and drew even at that time a surprisingly large number of reviews in academic journals. Many did not agree on a number of points with the author but all seem to agree with Tapan Rai Chaudhary, one of the reviewers, that it had succeeded in stirring in his words the turbid and yet extensive waters of Indian historiography. As uh, Farhat was also trying to say that it is also something to do with histori historiography rather than only the life. It can now be seen that on two points, or rather on the all the reviewers were unanimous. First, that the book added a mass of data well criticized, including statistical 
to enrich the field of pre-colonial economic history. And this data was collected from an extremely vast, varied array of sources. There were reservations also. <laughs> Expressed by some in writing, especially by Tapan Rai Chaudhary himself and by Riyazul Islam and others in oral statesmen such as Professor Tripathi, R.P. Tripathi, Professor Nurul Hassan and others, Professor Satish Chandra of course, that the depiction of the present misery was overdrawn and the consequential extent of lack of market for urban goods was a questionable assumption and rather than the following urbanization and all. It was perhaps, this reservation was perhaps well expected because those who were mainly criticizing or having reservations for those coming from the nationalist historians, school of nationalist historians, and they, most of them wrote at a time where country was yet to be freed and therefore all the time obliged to compare Mughal Empire with the British, what was happening under the British. But perhaps agrarian system was the beginning of the majority of the Indian historiography where a self-criticism, a more realistic appraisal of one's own past was becoming possible almost after 15 years of, ex of independence. 1963 means almost 15 years of independence. So surprisingly enough, Though Irfan Habib had written with basic principles of Marxist historical method in mind, and a, an Italian reviewer recognized it immediately as a quite definitely socialist standpoint, there was little response from what was already a large and influential Marxist school. There was neither criticism nor approbation. The first voice of dissent came from Burundi in his presidential address at the Indian History Congress as late as in 1988, in which he expressed his discomfort with the chapter on agrarian crisis of the Mughal Empire. However, there has been no real appraisal, if it won't appear presumptuous, there was rather a naive effort by me, attempt by me in 2011. Of, of, of how agrarian system fits in with the, the, the established Marxist framework. In the agrarian system, the massive corpus of factual data culled from all possible sources has been so arranged as to lead the reader step by step <coughs> to large scale generalizations about classes and forms of class struggle in Mughal India, generalizations that have not been seriously challenged to date. One wonders if one can trace genesis of this trait initially or partly to discomfort felt by Irfan Habib, perhaps very early in his academic career, with Marx's understanding of pre-colonial Indian society as an unchanging with fixed class structures a view summed up in his half-quoted statement of 1853, Indian society has no, no history at all, at least no known history. It almost appears that agrarian system was undertaken to counter this view of pre-colonial India by a study that was itself set within a framework of Marxist analysis. I'm sure my supervisor doesn't agree with my attribution to him, but this is my understanding of what I'm saying. In the agrarian system, the involvement in discovering and dissecting classes and class struggle seems to have overridden any interest that Irfan Habib may have had in the more theoretical issues debated within the Marxist academy, such as modes of production and the unilinear, unilinear chain of slavery, feudalism, capitalism. There was indeed a footnote in the agrarian system doubting the degree of influence of irrigation on agriculture 
that Marx attributed to the Asiatic mode of production. But the most explicit rejection of the concept of Asiatic mode of production in a sharp criticism of Wittfogel published of, uh, of even of Wittfogel published even before the agrarian system has come up was there. Not seemingly could Rafanabi accept the depiction feudal, the word feudal as Professor Uttar Patnaik has already emphasized was never used in agrarian system to characterize any relationship or institution. Not even he described while he describing the Zamidars at length. In 1960s, his disagreement with the fixed succession of mode of, mode of production was explicitly ma made manif manifest in a seminal essay, Problems of Marxist Historical Analysis. It's rather, one is puzzled why this article is not included in the collected work of his collect essay, the, um, in essays in uh, history a Marxist interpretation, whether deliberately or by an oversight. So, at the same time, he saw the new Western Marxist interest in the Asiatic mode as a reflection of the view held in the West that the class struggle and historical change emerging from them be regarded only as a European phenomena and by no means universal. The acceptance of which, in his world, would make a vast majority of mankind and an exception to the materialistic conception of history. Invoking the lat lat later silence maintained on it by Marx and Engels, he argued that the concept of Asiatic mode had been put aside by the founding fathers themselves. When in the, you know, Professor Fan Habib's understanding or rather the um, expression is that, that constant self, in, uh, constant inquiry, self-examination <coughs> and refining and extension of Marxist positions are the basic tenets of his, of his free writing. So if you find changes in his own writings, they are a part of this continuous exam self-examination and refining of Marxist understanding. When in the late 1970s, Irfan Abib undertook a detailed scrutiny of Marx's writing on India, leading to his essay, Marxist Perception of India, we get the first hint of a new approach to Marx's concept of Asiatic mode. If the form of labor under what Marx in Capital One called the petty mode of production, where peasant and self-employed artisans produced for the market, prevailed alongside the constraints on labor present in village community and the rent tax equivalents as the basis of the despotic state, all within the terminology used by Marx, then one would perhaps accept the Asiatic mode of pre-colonial India. Irfan Habib had, from very early in his studies, insisted on the presence of advanced elements of banking and insurance, and so the, prev the pervading role of commodity production in Mughal India. Citing Marx, he denied to it any pivotal role in economic development. The pressure of merchant capital in such developed forms seemed to constitute his main argument against the theory of the Asiatic mode at that time. But he has now argued that Marx himself allowed for conversion of agricultural surplus into commodities in pre-colonial India. So that the commodity relations relationship can be held to be excluded from Marx's concept of Asiatic mode. The information available now about the form of labor process and about accumulation suggests he argues, a fairly reasonable approximation to twin plus of Marx's Asiatic mode, namely the village community and the tax rent equivalence, Marx's medieval mode. Therefore can, uh, therefore, can given allowance for commodity relationships perhaps fairly be called modified Asiatic mode, or the commodity phase of the Asiatic mode. 
Irfan Habib, on the other hand, consistently rejected Samira means theory of tributary mode as being not a mode of production at all since it takes into account only the tax rent equivalence and excludes from it from exclude the form of labor process which in india at least was heavily influenced not only by market but also by caste and village community the tributary mode being divested of all relationship with the form of labor process appears to him to be inconsistent with Marxian method of analysis. Uh, I may add that uh, Professor Farad Hassan's understanding that Professor Habib's major involvement or uh, their obsession is the state is also not <coughs> very well placed because the <coughs> form of labor is something which he always keeps on emphasizing. And of course, you can't understand a society if you don't know the form of exploitation. So the form of labor along with form of exploitations, which means the state, they are the twin pillars for any analysis. Of course, Professor Habib will have his own say, but this is my naive understanding of the thing. The reconsideration of the Asiatic mode and a partial or qualified acceptance of it has seemingly led to two further development in the Khan Habib's study. It ignited a new interest in village community. This is one chapter which has been fully rewritten for the second edition, which he now no more sees as a survival of an earlier social form, kept alive only as a cog in Mughal revenue administration with its common financial pool being made a mere collection, collection point for streams of individual taxpayers. He now has begun to see further as an institution of local control of superior caste elements over the landless laborers and lower peasantry with caste restraints and demiurgic <coughs> labor to use max Weberian terminology and thus forming a system of sub-exploitation by the dominant ruler, ruler, rural classes. It is interesting to note then that it is in the revised edition of agrarian system in 1999, while the entire text has been revised, but the original arrangement retained, the only chapter which he has greatly enlarged and entirely rewritten has been the one devoted to village community. Part of the reason certainly lies in the fact that by now Ifan Habib had collected very rich documentary material on it that was not available to him in 1963 especially the Persian and Braj documents from Vrindavan. But partly too, the larger space devoted to it has, some, has stemmed from his new understanding of the village community as an instrument of class exploitation. Indeed, he speaks now of village aristocracy in conditions of joining the Zamidars as, adjoined, as additional junior allies for the ruling classes. Ifan Habib's position on the Asiatic state as a power instrument of exploitation is totally contrary to the recent, as uh, represented the postmodern tendency to deny the existence of the unified surplus extracting the state in pre-colonial India. The denial began with Burton and Steen's application of the segmentary state thesis to South India and attained semi-mystical mis dimensions in Andre Wien. The subaltern's autonomy fixation tends in the same direction. Confronted with this, Habib's approach seems to be stubbornly conventional based on sources and record rather than on a priori hypothesis. In, an, in, uh, in a same, in a sense, and this made his agrarian system, second edition in his still more cohesive work. But did it still lend his magna opus the ideal completeness that one might rather unreasonably still demand of it? It is still, I venture to suggest, does not answer or adequately grapple with the question of peasant consciousness and the limitations of peasant resistance, resistance in India compared to China and Western Europe. The 
I think the main problem or the main reason for this is that he always has a hesitation to commit on something for which he doesn't have adequate evidence coming from the contemporary sources. Since Efanabi maintained for his second edition the agrarian of the agrarian system, the same framework fashioned for the first edition, we can discern the theoretical influence of his latter and wider research work in the second edition only here and there. The handling of technology of agriculture and craft is doubtless much superior on Chuara. Geographical details are further improved. The remarks on succeeding colonial regime further sharpened. However, one feels rather disappointed to see that he has not rather used his own somewhat insightful analysis of uh, class struggle, of um, class consciousness from, from his paper or monograph, class, uh, Forms of Class Struggle in Mughal India. He has not even inc incorporated it in India. At best, earlier it was mentioned in a footnote, now it has been promoted to the text. In that essay, he had discussed the barriers to the emergence and growth of peasant class consciousness in late Mughal India, analyzing the great, in great details the effect of caste affinities, the amalgamation of zamidars' grievances with those of peasants against overtaxation in jata pricing, as well as intervention of religious preaching of particular kind, as in the case of the Satnami and Sikh revolt, that enlarged the scale but weaken the class nature of the rewards. Perhaps that discussion meets some of the objections by Professor Farhatasan. He is skeptical even of the plausibility of the assertion that present class consciousness was present, but is not known to us only because the slogans raised by the illiterate peasants were totally lost, being left unrecorded by the host hostile scribes of the ruling class. To him, it seems that the limitation is real, not only apparent. The slogan we hope to find might never have been raised in his words. One wonders whether he felt the last conclusion too pessimistic or tactically inconvenient from the viewpoint of today's present movement to give it a place in agrarian system. At the end of the day, these complaints appear trivial when said by the side of what has been achieved. To borrow from what his supervisor, Colin C. Davies, wrote of the first edition in a review, a closer task has now been done twice over. And this can only be celebrated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shireen. Uh, I just, you know, I think it's evident to all of us that we have seriously misunderstood the uh, underestimated the uh, the extent of interest in this seminar so we are making amends we plan to move to the larger hall next door so we're going to have the coffee break now and then we will follow with professor Najaf Haider and professor Irfan Habib and the open discussion I hope that's all right with all of you so uh, let's go for coffee and try and come back in 15 minutes and we will adjourn to the larger auditorium Thank you.